Tommy. Hey, hello. Boy, is he dead too? We're going to expand our weekly video segment to take you into the back shelves of your local video store. Back where it says horror videos and where kids are devouring some awful films that we call the video nasties. Are you freebasing? Inquiring minds want to know. I have to break free from this culture of mechanical reproductions and the thick encrustations dying on the surface. What the prime time gets. Pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, come with me and be immortal. We have such sights to show you. I've gotta return some video tape. Hello, whore hounds, and welcome to the It Slays podcast. I'm your humble host, Rowan. And this is the flimsy fishing rod that broke when you were trying to catch a seahorse in Animal Crossing Mike. And we have a very special guest tonight, or today, whenever you're listening to this, I guess. A wonderful guest. An extraordinary uh, whore hound Patreon subscriber for us, but just a amazing horror fanatic in general, film fanatic in general, I think is probably more yeah accurate. That's, that's definitely accurate yeah mr Colton. yeah thanks for having me yeah uh you know it's a pleasure to be here i mean i've been following you guys since the very first episode so uh yeah it's we're been, sorry <laughs> it's been like what like nine months trying to b- bring this together so uh yeah no it's a pleasure to be here thanks for having me who would have thought it would take the world grinding to a screeching halt for us to actually get <laughs> our shit together <laughs> You always get bored enough to bring me on the show. So. <laughs> I mean, <listen. laughs> perfect. This could be a weekly thing. <laughs> never, perfect. yeah, never that, never that. So, uh, let's take some time. Like, if you just want to maybe talk about kind of your experiences with horror and any, you know, how you got into it, age, kind of favorite movies, just a general overview for the yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm definitely a big horror fan. I'm a, you know, a screenwriter and an aspiring filmmaker. So. You know, I've written a couple of like feature length horror movies, so it is a genre that I'm very passionate about and also one that I'd love to work in someday. But in terms of like my horror experience, uh, I grew up in like a very Christian household, so it wasn't like, you know, my mom wasn't like saying, hey, let's watch Nightmare Nightmare on Elm Street or, you know, Friday the 13th or anything like that. Uh, It was sort of the thing like I'd have to watch at a friend's house and, you know, kind of heat on the down low, like, you know, uh, but probably like one of my earliest ones I watched was Ghost Ship. And I remember being oh, nice. just like absolutely <laughs> floored when like that that wire comes through and like chops everyone up in the beginning of the movie <laughs> or uh, Freddy versus Jason like back in the day when I didn't know that was supposed to be funny and tongue in cheek. I remember I was just like terrified of it. So, uh, yeah, in, in terms of my like general horror, what I like, it's uh, I'm a big fan of The Shining, of course, you know, I'm a big fan of The Thing. And in terms of like more modern movies, like uh I, I do like like Hereditary, but you know, Get Out is excellent, and It Follows. I think it was like your very first episode, or maybe second it episode. Was. Like It Follows is like one of my favorite of the last ten years. So yeah, oh, it's a masterpiece. I actually remember the two of us gushing over the soundtrack oh, yeah. after we both yeah. saw it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think I'm like actually referenced on that very first or second episode. I think so. Yeah, was my name. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, sweet, I got a shout out, and you know, here I am, like a year later or so. So. Did you both see that in the theater, or I saw it in theater? I'm not yes. sure. Oh, Mike, yeah, yeah. I, saw I, saw it. It. I saw it at the Mount Pearl Theater. <laughs> yeah, same, me, same. me and Exilia yeah. came late to the party on that one. We saw it at Brad's house on <laughs> on Brad's like house. Apple TV. <laughs> on Apple TV. I oh, just remember. Sweet. Yeah, and then our lives were changed forever. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's one like when I watched it, I just absolutely loved like just how tense it was the entire time but it's one that i don't find is actually like great to show people i find a lot of people kind of like getting bored (laughs) like watching it but no i was like on the edge of my seat the entire time so it's kind of like a cool test i think it's like is this how are you going to react to this movie like that's like this is going to affect what type of movie i want to show this person for the rest of our friendship like are you going to be a flawless person or is it going to have to be a like just the marvels and all that right (laughs) Yeah, I have a movie that I kind of show a lot of my friends, like Swiss Army Man. I don't know if either of you guys have seen that, but it is fucking weird. And if I have a friend that's like, oh, I really like that. I'm like, all right, 
I can understand, like, we could watch weirder movies, whereas if they don't, I'm like, all right, we'll keep it a little bit more vanilla. <laughs> yeah, there you go, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Batman versus Superman it is. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> No, please, only the parts with Wonder Woman. <laughs> yeah, true. I'm actually, uh, I'm not done it yet, but I'm in the middle of watching uh, Under the Silver Lake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, not quite as good as It Follows, I would no. say, but no. Yeah. But it, very interesting to see, like, a non-horror version of, like, David Mitchell. Very Yeah, it's very strange. It's definitely closer to, like, Lynchian horror than just your classic, you know, what you'd see in most cinemas, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I figure, as always, we start off with a question of the day. And I really reflected on this one and realized that we have not done and this is our first uh pandemic episode <laughs> great <laughs> that's now, what we're calling them now <laughs> yeah so i figured we had to go with something in that vein so i figured uh i would ask you guys uh you know what have you been doing with your quality quarantine time uh you know what have you been reading watching playing just hobbies what have you been doing as you're quarantined in the house and i'm jealous I mean, other than, like, procrastinating, like, pushing my writing, like, as late in the day as possible, <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've been playing, like, a couple of video games, like, playing Control on PS4, and, you know, I kind of looked over that one last year in September, and it was on sale, like, last week, so I picked it up for 30 bucks, and I've been loving that. I mean, I think me, along with most of the rest of the world, watched Tiger King within the last last week. And uh, I still haven't watched it. Uh, dude, like I loved it. I'm not going to lie. It was like <laughs> the perfect mix of like trashy, like reality TV shows. But I also, love like, trash. <laughs> oh, dude, if you love trash, you're going to love it. Like I, I was watching it. And it was the perfect mix of like, I don't know, some like beat crocodile hunter mixed with, I don't know, making a murderer or something from Netflix. Right. It was like teetering on that edge the entire time i loved it i i watched all the whole series in one sitting and i'm not someone who usually binge washes shit so uh yeah that's you know basically procrastination i guess and you know watching a little bit of stuff i don't know i like that answer procrastination and tiger king <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> that could be the title of an autobiography um yeah that's i'm sure somebody's already working on that frankly how about yourself oh i i want to say i've been procrastinating but uh since i'm currently in limbo of employment <laughs> i really don't have much to procrastinate um because i decided not to work on anything at the moment i also have been playing a lot of video games which is not really mm -hmm. that much different from my usual routine, except I would be playing them when I get home from work. Um, I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing like everybody else in the world that I know. Dude, um, I never picked it oh, up and I really should have. <laughs> it's, I'm telling you, and I'm visiting my friend's islands and like watching them develop it. And it's, it's so cute and innocuous. And I, usually I play like a lot of like competitive online stuff lately. So this is a really nice break from the like toxicity of like online gaming with with oh, other yeah, people sure. um it's just it's so cute and like innocuous and i will just literally be like last night i was lying in bed watching twitch on my phone and i made the mistake of bringing my switch into my bedroom and plugging it in next to my bed so that i wouldn't have it run out and it was like five o'clock in the morning and the sun was coming up and i was like i need to put down animal crossing like i just need to turn it off i need to get it out of my bedroom like this is not a good idea so that's been yeah. consuming my life um pretty much non-stop for the last well i didn't get it when it first came out like everybody else i got it like four or five days ago so i've got a lot of okay. catching up to do but i've also been watching um the adaptation of lock and key on netflix which i'm really enjoying yeah i haven't watched that yet is, it is good? that good i haven't yeah. seen it either i i really like it so far um it's actually surpassed where i read i read the first like i want to say two trades of the graphic novel okay um yeah. Maybe not even, I might have even only read one and a half because I used to read them at work. But um, yeah, we've definitely surpassed where I read and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. So now um, I know that once I'm almost finished the first season, I have to um, to go back and, and reread them from the beginning. Awesome. But it's, it's really great. It's really great. The cast is excellent. The locations, it's, it's so Canadian. Like I know it's supposed to be American, but I was like, this is very, very clearly Nova Scotia. <laughs> and like half the cast is Canadian. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, I haven't read the graphic novels or watched the TV show so that's definitely one i need to catch up on i mean people have been recommending me lock and key the graphic novels for ages so yeah i mean joe hill like it's kind of it's got that a lot of like you know i hate comparing him to his father but like it's kind of got a lot yeah. of like the classic you know stephen kingy hallmarks you know what i mean so 
Oh, which yeah, I enjoy. Sure. It's it's he's classic for a reason. He's a modern classic. Yeah, I, I'm in the same boat. Like everyone always recommends that uh, graphic novel to me, and I haven't mm-hmm. read it. I should do it. And everyone, the reviews seem pretty good on the show, so I will definitely uh, have to check that out. What See, this is what happens. I, yeah, I ask these questions, and then I never think about my own uh, response. I was just about to ask, what have you been doing to keep yeah. busy during the quarantine? <laughs> uh, well, I've been working. Uh, probably. Yeah five to six days a week so i'm like a frontline healthcare worker so oh, i get to geez. be in the uh i work in like a long-term care facility so that's always a good time oh my uh, god especially <laughs> nowadays oh man <laughs> yeah so uh i mean the only good thing is that i'm like well at least i have like some income going on because mm-hmm. uh I'm, I'm starting to crack i i kind of was like you know what i'm not gonna order from amazon like i don't need anything i don't need sickness shipped to me yeah. but th- i'm cracking i'm like i need that uh screen factory april fool's day asap <laughs> you do so have I a problem I, i'm just saying yeah <laughs> i know i i so i'm gonna have to order it i feel i'm falling behind here but other than that i have a lot of reading the libraries here since this whole pandemic has started have been offering basically like if you register for a library card you just get like free you just get free like rentals on for digital okay so believe it or not uh my very first time i read the killing joke i would oh, never nice, read it nice. before yeah so uh i really enjoyed that uh i was kind of worried because i was worried it was gonna be like one of those overhyped things and i was gonna read it and then just kind of be like uh but no, it was it was fantastic. Really loved it. I've kind of had some uh, Netflix Riverdale withdrawal because me and Exilia are pretty heavy in the Riverdale. <laughs> See, I'm making Colton choke because he's like, oh, that's that's even yeah, trashier I know. than the I, Tiger King. I can't get game. over that. I can't get down with that. <laughs> the taste. <laughs> yeah, Where I, is I, it? I'd much rather Tiger King. Come on, guys. Because they've been on like a, every once in a while, they take like a two week break before they mm-hmm. release a new episode. So I actually uh, read the um, Jughead the Hunger graphic novel. Oh, yes. Which is part of this whole new horror archy adult line. Yeah, I was going to ask that if that was part of that line yeah yeah and i i really liked it it was really fantastic i've only read like volume one and then i read the uh first volume of uh vampironica which was also fantastic if you're a horror guy like you'll really like it or, or horror gal <laughs> but uh no they're like really fantastic they're super bloody like they're very violent and it yeah it's just fantastic did you read yeah, afterlife with out. archie yeah i actually collected oh, okay. afterlife okay. with archie in the single okay. that issues one's excellent when it first yeah. came out yeah and uh i also collected all of, um like sabrina when they had first re-released that yeah kind of i think that's kind of what got the show going was the the release of that mm-hmm. uh i'm trying to think i haven't really been watching a lot of like movies i rewatched virtuosity the other day i love it yeah i oh my god one of my favorite movies uh, i don't Col- think i've ever seen it weirdly enough yeah it's uh, it's kind of obscure honestly um <laughs> so it was as a kid i used to rent it at blockbuster like six months at a time it would get to the point where like they'd call me and be like do you know where this movie is <laughs> Um, yeah, like, yes, it's in my bedroom. And I'm thinking, like, who else is renting this other than me? Anyway, Colton, it is... Yeah, who's uh, in it? What is it? What's it about? So it's early 90s. Okay. I'd say early to mid-90s. It's uh, Russell Crowe and Denzel Washington. All right, all um, right. Basically, uh, Denzel Washington is a, like, a cop that uh, is in prison uh, for, you know, I think I think he's, he's in there for, like, murdering people that murdered his family. Uh, but he's kind of, you get the impression he's in there for you know he shouldn't be in there something else oh okay he's innocent is what they're going for he's innocent oh okay the government is using a program where they're training cops in virtual reality and they're using (laughs) prisoners as tests all right yes you laugh and and it's it's very laughable it was it's one of those like 90s like just did not age well after like the first day it was out (laughs) 
movie. Well, it's it's... Certainly, it certainly it reminds me of like Ender's Game a little bit, like the twist of Ender's Game almost, like where I was like, hey, we're training for this big war, but no, we've been killing all these bug people. So. Yeah, <laughs> but just with, I think you know. it's I can't remember if it's the director or the writer. One of them did the Lawnmower Man as well. Okay, and it's very in that vein, like the the graphics and everything. But Russell Crowe plays a virtual reality serial killer, and he's supposed to be every murderer and serial killer's mind uploaded into this bean and then it's basically about nanotechnology basically the end of the story is they make this virtual serial killer real in real life okay <laughs> is and it like a he, crazy performance by russell crowe like oh, i it's expect that'd be off the it's wall absolutely batshit and it was it's very early like, in his career wasn't it so like i feel oh like, yeah, yeah very early mm -hmm. but it's uh yeah i just I love it. And the only other two things I really have note, um, I'm slowly finishing up Happy right now on Netflix. The new season, which I'm I really like. It's that's off the wall. And uh on Shudder, I'm watching the uh NOS uh four A two. Oh Nosferatu. Oh, Nosferatu. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Nosferatu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're reading it as a license plate, it's NOS four A two. Uh but yeah, I'm watching that right now. I'm almost done. I'm on the last episode. No, I, have, I haven't heard anything about that. Is it? How is it? Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, I can't think of the guy. What's the guy's name? Like Quentin from Star Trek. Plays Spock in the new Star Trek movie. Oh, Zachary, Zachary Quinto. 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 Yes. Yeah, Quint yeah Quinto. Um, He plays Mr. Minx, the, uh, the vampire. It, it's really, really good. I, mm. especially Mike, I think you would be into it. The, uh, the heroine is super badass, like leather jackets, leather boots, drives a motorcycle, like teenage girl. I have the book. I just haven't read it yet. And because I haven't read the book yet, I didn't want to watch it. Cause yeah, you know me, I'm I've, a book I've, before the movie type of guy. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been, I've never read the book. I read a comic that wasn't that it was like a sequel yeah but i didn't i didn't know it was just called the wraith and i didn't know at the time that it was a sequel to anything and i really enjoyed it and but yeah i definitely suggest it uh i mean shutter's got a lot of great original programming so yeah no, i know i'm subscribed to the service but i i, I don't know it's, i guess it must have been a week or two since i've been on there i never saw anything about it so oh yeah no i shutter's also i find one of those things where like i mean we've had the subscription for since like august or something yeah maybe before and it's like one of those things i always forget i have and then i'm never on there 100 percent yeah, I I go, you know, I go to Netflix and I'm like, oh, what's on here? And then there's mm -hmm. nothing on there. You're leaving yeah, a horror shutter here. like just in the lurch. Hey, Can't yeah, believe you're doing know. this. A horror fan of your caliber and just. I Sorry, well, guys. yeah, dude, I was the same way. I, I got it for, I think it was called Tigers Are Not Afraid back in September. I bought yeah. it for oh, that yeah. movie. I couldn't find it like anywhere. So I was like, oh, all right, I'll get Shutter for this. And I just, I think I forgot I was paying for it until like December or January. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I, we started using it recently to kind of use for like uh, watch alongs online with friends, you know, kind of. Yeah, it works out well for this period. But yeah. But no, it's it's been good. You know, we always check out that first before we go anywhere else looking for a horror movie to watch. I like yeah, their themes I... that they have. Like, they're like, here's, you know, ghost movies or whatever. And it's kind of cool to just go like, I'm really in the mood for something like that. And if you're not in the mood for something supernatural, go like, oh, look, like slashers and killers. Like, this is. Yeah. I'll probably yeah. find some well... random thing that I've never heard of before that might be awful, but it might be really fun. Yeah, they put a lot of work into, I think, like, their original posters, too. Like, it's funny. Like, there's some garbage movies on there as well, but you look at the posters and you're like, man, that They're looks They're very nicely done, yeah. And then you yeah. check out the reviews and it's got, like, one out of five skulls or whatever they used to review <laughs> yeah, movies yeah. on there. Like, oh, shit, never mind. And the way I look at it, you know what? Netflix does not have an entire curated section, like, just dedicated to Argento. So. Exactly, yeah. So fuck them, first of all. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Unless they'd like to give us some money and we can sponsor us. <laughs> In which case, not fuck them. Sellouts. I, I, right. I welcome our um, corporate overlords <laughs> money. <laughs> 100 percent i guess it's probably time we uh get into the film for the evening so this was a patreon pick so uh i was very careful to make sure i didn't say aloud what episode i'm editing right now because i'm like 
I'll probably end up releasing this somewhere in the jumble of it. Okay. But this was definitely a amazing Patreon pick uh, from Colton. Uh, and uh, it's only right that we let Colton introduce it, I think. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is a uh, Robert Eggers uh, like uh, feature debut. Like he had a couple of short films before this, uh, you know, the telltale heart, I think back in 2008. And he had a, it's kind of like a Cain and Abel type story, I think. And, 2013 or 14 while he was trying to get you know some financing for this but yeah we're talking about robert eggers the witch and uh of course if you're a horror fan you've definitely heard of this movie i would say over the last few years uh i think most people would probably put it in like the pantheon of like modern horror classics i would say so and uh i mean a lot of people kind of look up at it as uh like one of the granddaddies i think of like this modern uh kind of prestige horror movement or elevated horror movement you know i've heard you guys talk about it before (laughs) uh kind of like the pretentious horror movement somewhat (laughs) so uh which is not a read it's it's obviously we love it (laughs) yeah no it's uh it's a movie that i chose uh not even necessarily because i'd say it's like my favorite horror movie of all time or anything like i honestly don't even know if it'd be in my top like 10 or 20 but at the time when I chose it, I was thinking of kind of like as a producer and I was like, all right, you know, the lighthouse is coming out in like a month or two. You know, if they get get out with this, the witch review, it'll do well for them. They can roll right into the lighthouse and, and uh, then procrastination. Yeah. Here we are. Like, I don't know, nine or <laughs> ten months later <laughs> talking about the witch. So literally uh, yeah. a baby could be gestated in this time period. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We so, have the uh, quarant- we have the quarantine on our side. It's been amazing for our numbers. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, no, it's uh, it's uh, definitely something. And I think uh, if you watch the movie, I mean, you'll definitely understand why Robert Eggers is being kind of heralded as at least like a really strong voice in the modern horror movement, I would say. That is a great uh, intro. Far better than we would have given it. <laughs> it's I, true, I, though. I, I mean, it's 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 very important to like this kind of like renaissance that is happening yeah. right now my intro would have been like oh i put this in the dvd player and <laughs> asked Zillia if she was <laughs> if she was ready to watch the vavitch oh yeah 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 uh all the proper spelling when this movie came out like everyone on reddit and stuff t- typing up the two v's and it's just like oh man i don't know <laughs> like and i would i will say i didn't real like until i started to actually like research it i i <laughs> really didn't get it i thought it was just like some pretentious thing well with robert eggers it, it kind of is <laughs> <laughs> like a nerd. He's such a nerd for like yeah. old like English and uh, language that like I think it was like well back in the day they would use two V's instead of a W. <laughs> so I think it was something like that. Yeah, I was gonna say I read I was looking at it uh, this afternoon and it, apparently it was like W wasn't really used like then. It was kind of still a new thing. Mm-hmm. That's uh, that's just weird to say. It's like oh that this brand new letter W. It's odd. But yeah, no, fantastic. So uh, I figure we'll uh, get into the trailer and then we'll come back, get the bio out of the way, and then uh, let's get into this sucker. Oh yeah, let's go. What went we out into this wilderness to find? Leaving our country kindred, our father's houses. For what? For the kingdom of God. Let us pray. this family. Come and 
So that was the trailer, and let's get into the IMDb bio for this. A family in the 1630s New England is torn apart by the forces of witchcraft, black magic, and possession. Pretty wow, true. very yeah. elaborate bio that is. I, I really hope that the people that contribute those don't ever get paid for them. Because <laughs> I mean, someone was slacking on that one. Yeah. To be fair, not much actually happens in this movie. I'm just throwing saying, shade like, I, already, I, Mike. Come on. <laughs> I got it. Listen, this is going to be a shady place in the next couple months. <laughs> <laughs> this this being stuck inside all the time is is turning me into a king of shade. But we should I, have chose the lighthouse a lot more thematically relevant. Just being stuck in like one spot, <laughs> but. Well, that can, that can be the sequel, right? Like it's yeah, yeah, that might have to happen. I was gonna say too, like I can't really rag on them too much because if it was my job to write the bio, I know how that would have went. Like I'd look and it'd be like five minutes until the deadline, and I would just the bio for me would be like, "There's a witch," and that would be the bio. <laughs> Mine would run on for like two or three paragraphs, and you know most people <laughs> kind of just glaze over by the end. So. Well, I mean, there's something to be said for concision, but there's also something to be said for actually saying something. <laughs> I'm just there's saying. There's a happy medium somewhere <laughs> yeah, in there, there, for sure. There, somewhere well, there. We might never yeah. find it, but. So I figure let's talk about maybe uh, our, like, is this our first time watching it? Or what What our first times watching it were? Just kind of our experiences with the film since it's been released. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you're the guest, Colton, so... You yeah, first. this this movie is a, a strange one for me because it is essentially the reason why I started attending like film festivals like back okay. in I think it was like 2015 or so this movie was being lauded as like one of the scariest movies of all time like endorsed by the satanic temple like the trailer was crazy and I remember watching it as kind of like a horror fan and being like holy shit like I gotta see this. Uh, so I saw that it was going to TIFF and basically uh, me and the person I was dating at the time, we just booked the whole trip around going to TIFF. But the main reason I wanted to go was to see The Witch. So, that you know, dedication. I, I think we had like tickets to like 30 or movies overall or something. But yeah, like I was actually at the Canadian premiere of The Witch. I think it premiered at Sundance. So it wasn't the North American or the world premiere. But I was there with like Robert Eggers in attendance and Anya Taylor Joy, and uh, I remember kind of as we watched it, um, the audience was very, I think, confused and maybe bored. I don't know; they may have been asleep. I'm not sure. <laughs> the Q and A uh, portion was like painful to get through. But I remember, like, as I watched it, did it live up to the hype of like six months of build up and you know, paying a thousand dollars for me to go out? No, probably not. But. It was definitely something when I watched it, I was like, oh, there's going to be a lot of people that like laud this as a masterpiece, for example, you know, like it, it's definitely a, a screening I remember. And since then, I've seen it a couple of other times, you know, I watched it in theaters here in St. John's and I own like the Steelbook Blu-ray copy. But, you know, it's not something I turn on every every couple of months or every year or anything. It's a uh, it's a bit of a it's definitely a slow burn, like prestigious horror movie, you know, it's very elevated. Oh, for sure. But I mean, it is so well done. Like, you can I don't care what your thoughts are on this, and I understand people, like, blowing their wads all over it, and I understand people that can't <laughs> get through it, cough, cough, exilia, without falling asleep. <laughs> I Like, listen, I totally get it, but, like, yeah. you can never, the one thing you cannot say about this is that it is not like a meticulously crafted piece of film and, like yeah and i think that's the reason why i really like it i think when i watch robert eggers movies i feel like i'm in the hands of a very capable filmmaker like even if it is slow or boring i go like he wants it to be slow and boring here even if we're yeah. like i don't know on a close-up of a goat it's like 
he, he really wants this close up of Black Phillip here for some reason. And then, you know, by the end of the movie, you kind of realize why. But I think everything in this movie, he is very chosen to kind of elicit like certain this like feeling of kind of like foreboding throughout the entire thing. Like I even though it is kind of a slow movie, I, I do feel like we're like teetering right on the edge of like everything going wrong. Like there's something that feels like kind of evil when I'm watching this movie. Even You know, it's just a couple of kids running around in a yard. It's uh no, I think he's a very interesting filmmaker to watch for sure. Absolutely. And games. I mean, like for, for, for a slow burn movie, it's very well paced. Like it never, I don't think it drags, even though it's like I said, it's like a smoldering movie as opposed to, you know, something that's very visceral most of the time. But, um, and I mean, yeah, but they... like you were saying, the attention to detail and stuff, like, mm-hmm. like the the two V's. I mean, the language <laughs> that he, yeah, 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 you know, that they speak in and everything. Everything is just so meticulous. Like it, it makes my skin There's, crawl. Yeah. Like it's so well done. <laughs> There's something like almost like Shakespearean about the movie, or like very theatrical, and just the the speech. Like as I was watching it this time, like I, I don't usually watch movies with subtitles, but we got to like a line that I was like wait, what the hell was that? And then I just turned on subtitles. I was like, I've already seen it two or three times. Like, you know, I could see like him pick apart the dialogue. And it was just like, yeah, some of these lines are like Robert Eggers ass dialogue. And <laughs> I, I, I don't know if like every screenwriter can say that, like, you know, oh, people can pick my dialogue and know it's me like right away. Right. Like with this movie, there's, <laughs> you know, right away it's Robert Eggers and same with like his follow up film. So. So how about you, Mike? Uh, did you also saw it in the theater or? I did. Yes, I did not go to TIFF, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, yes, I've, al- I've I've always been jealous of Colton's um you know let's just call them pilgrimages every year annual pilgrimages it, but, yeah yeah oh um, man I I you know that's the one thing about this coronavirus I'm really worried about I mean other than you know family and loved ones I'm worried else, about Tiff yeah. being canceled as well you know so yeah no every year when uh, I see the reviews start coming in and all the pictures mm-hmm. I always think of you and I'm like I wonder what movies Colton is going to see like today and. <laughs> Oh man, it's... there's some days there, five and six movies. It's uh, it's it's amazing, but it's also quite tiring for sure. Well, and I feel like that's, you know, maybe not the like, like you know, when you say people are like falling asleep during the witch and the Q and A yes. was painful. Like yeah. it's, you know, that was probably like their sixth movie of the day. It just seems, you know, like maybe wedging it in amongst forty other movies <laughs> in yeah, three days is. I... Ill-advised. Yeah, maybe I'll get maybe I'll get to the Q and A later on, but man, there is some painful stuff in there for sure. <laughs> but anyways, go well, on. Uh, I did I I did see it here in St. John's, and I believe it was probably the first week it was out, and it was actually with an old coworker of me and Colton's because we worked together once upon a time, uh, named Daryl, and he's also a big horror fan. And oh, uh, sh- shout out to Daryl. Um, he one day we were working together, and we were off at the same time, you know, like five or six o'clock, and he said, "The Witch started playing a few days ago." what are you doing? Let's go see it and go get a beer. So that's what we did. It was wonderful. It was, you know, really nice to see it in theaters because it's, you know, even though it seems like there's not, it's not like a Dario Argento film in terms of like every, you know, like this jam-packed like tableau on every frame that like you can pick Mm -hmm. apart every shadow and like everything is, you know, specifically designed to evoke some kind of like response or make reference to like some fairy tale. But like, it's still one of those movies that is so like well shot and stuff and it just the sound is so important oh, and man. subtle. Everything about it is very subtle, so it's really nice to see it on a big screen, I guess. So it was really nice to see it in theaters and sort of just have and it's so immersive, right? Like it's mm-hmm. you just kind of like are on that little farm, <laughs> you know, like with those fucking did, creepy ass kids. Did like half of your audience walk out while watching it as well? <laughs> because when I watched it in St. John's, there was a bunch of teenagers that just left like 20 minutes in. Well, this was probably like a Tuesday night. So oh, okay. there, I think there was maybe five or six other people in the theater other than us. Oh, okay. Nobody walked out of it. So that was something. I mean, <laughs> I guess on a, That's always a positive. On a, like a, the middle of a week showing, hopefully it's probably just people that actually want to see it and not yeah like, yeah friday night when they're just like oh look that's supposed to be a horror movie let's just get wasted and go watch it scream at it yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah i unfortunately didn't uh see it in the theater i do remember i remember the trailer dropping I remember seeing the trailer and i was like oh yeah that looks that looks cool the trailer was um, very well done by the way that was the marketing campaign was a plus and it was and now i was thinking about when i rewatched the trailer today 
that I remember seeing the trailer, and then when I actually did see the movie, I'm like, they marketed it where this isn't what you expected from the trailer. Mm -hmm. I expected something way different, like, and, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Like, I think I was expecting something a little more just kind of generic mainstream. I thought it was going to be just kind of something I'd see and be like, oh, well, whatever. Uh, I actually didn't see this till I bought it. Oh, wow. And, uh... I have to give a real, uh, like, St. John shout out. Because, so I bought the Steel Book, and I did not buy it at Walmart. I didn't buy it at HMV. I bought it at Traders when I was at Traders <laughs> oh, one day. <laughs> and you, you had, had a period of copy. buying all of your movies at Traders. I would try. Somebody was Traders definitely stealing time. movies and bringing them to Traders because you were always getting these wicked gems at traders i was just about to say, oh yeah yeah next time i go and try and find an indie movie at walmart <laughs> and it's sold out i'm just gonna go straight to traders and i got it traders like it was still like in the package Jeez. like price tag on it i think i paid like six bucks for it for the steel book so uh that's when i saw it and that would have been probably months after it was released on blu-ray mm -hmm. and i just i sat down with it and i was very pleasantly surprised at what it was compared to what I thought it was. I feel like uh, witch horror movies kind of always, when I hear that, like rub me the wrong way. I don't know why, but I just like, it's hard to think of good witch movies. I, I have a hard time thinking of witch movies, like period, like what, Hocus Pocus? <laughs> and I don't know what else. <laughs> I, I always just think of Suspiria immediately. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, of course, well, I, is I not even saying, that witch than, movie. It's a fucking, like, it's its own goddamn category. Yeah, and so. I was going to say, other than Suspiria, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's all kind of all I can think about. And, I mean, we reviewed Hoax Pokes. Everyone knows my unpopular opinions on that one. <laughs> but, yeah, that that was my first experience with it. And, like you said, Colton, I'm kind of the same way. Um, I can't say it's something. It's something that I always want to show people, but it's something I, myself, I probably would only watch maybe once a year. Like, I definitely like to revisit it. But this probably isn't going to get like, you know, every week I'm going to pop it in for a good time. Yeah, it's funny because as I was watching it this time, like Mike said, like, you know, it's all incredibly paced. But it was funny. I was like, oh, my God, I was wrong. Like, this is like a masterpiece for like 15, 20 minutes. And then after a while, I was like, OK, you know, Caleb's acting isn't the greatest. <laughs> he's kind of <laughs> he's the weak point of the cast. And I'm like. All right, he just got lured into like this witch's hovel and the movie kind of slows down for 10 or 15 minutes. It becomes about like, who stole the silver cup? You know, was it <laughs> Anya Taylor-Joy or was it William the father? And, uh, you know, I was like, I started falling off a little bit there, you know, you know, and then, you know, the ending is just phenomenal. Like that whole like last act is amazing. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's it's a movie that like every single time I go in, I go like man like this is supposed to be amazing i have all these expectations and i don't know they're met to a certain degree i think you know and i mean i feel like we always like to somewhat bring up the cast i i did write a couple down because i mean a lot of people that were there's not a lot of people in the cast period but a lot of people that kind of played minor roles this is like what they've been in mm -hmm. like Anya Taylor Joy. I knew we couldn't get away without talking about oh that. Well, Mike would murder me. Like, <laughs> like amazing. Go ahead, Mike. You're, you just no, I was just going to say she's fucking phenomenal. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, what a find. And I like I was I was surprised actually at quite a few like uh, sim similarities actually in the filmographies of a lot of these actors where these guys have worked together on a lot of stuff mm -hmm. like all of these like uh I wrote down, like, notables for Anya Taylor-Joy. Uh, like, she was in Split. She was in Glass. Mm -hmm. uh, she was in Barry. I don't know how many... I think Barry kind of got slept on. That was um, the, the Barack Obama. Obama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not Barry. Yeah, the yeah. HBO show, yeah. Uh, she's in the new Dark Crystal Netflix show. Uh, she's in Peaky Blinders. Yeah, she's and, in an indie movie called Thoroughbreds, which was yes. really good, I remember. Yeah, yeah. And a weird alien one called Morgan, which was not so good, but... And her probably greatest role yet to come that I know Mike is just dying for is uh, Magic, New Mutants. Oh, New Mutants oh, is literally God. never going to see the light of day. It's never going to be released. That's going to get dumped on Disney Plus in, like, I don't know, three months' time without a trailer or any fanfare or anything. Yep. <laughs> like that's and gonna be and the, the runtime will be, like, 73 minutes. 
<laughs> like yeah, they will have just 100%. chopped the entire plot out of it. And... Which is a shame because I feel like it was a cool. It's a cool idea to oh, do a horror sure. comic book movie. Everything but I just know on paper was brilliant. That's the thing. I just know how much Ileana means to Mike in his heart. Yes. And and then yeah. when they announced that she was playing her, I was like, "This is perfection!" Like she even looks mm-hmm. like her. She's a phenomenal actress. Like she has charisma out the ass. This character is yeah. charismatic. You know, it's one of my favorite like comic book properties. And we all know the tangled, sordid <laughs> history of this movie. It's it's a cursed movie. Like oh, you know, absolutely. coronavirus happens because <laughs> New Mutants was kind of released. Like oh, it's terrible. Yeah. Like I will I will say though, uh, the character named Thomason probably not on the top list of names I'll name my child. So no, it's such a weird name. I, I, like I, it must be like period accurate yeah, or something it's gotta be. because. Yeah, because it is a very strange name. So I was also going to bring up, like, uh, Ralph Ineson, who plays William, the father. Oh, yeah. Like I said, I wasn't familiar with uh, He, I kind of recognized. I was like, he can't really think about where I've seen him from in. But he's in a bunch of the Harry Potter movies. Okay. Which I've never, I've watched one of those. I've never, <laughs> not really my bag. <laughs> Yeah, but, I've um, seen them all, but I wouldn't be able to pick him out, I don't think. He's in Game of Thrones. I know what's her face is in Game of Thrones. Like uh Catherine, like the mother, is in Game yeah, of Thrones. Kate she's Dickey playing... is al- also in Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, because uh she's like what breastfeeding a lot of this movie and in Game of Thrones <laughs> it's the same thing, but she's like breastfeeding her eight year old son or something. Like it's pretty off putting. Um, I've always said that that actress because the only th- the two things I know her from are this and Game of Thrones, obviously, because that was yeah. something that I watched from the beginning. I don't know. There's something about her. Every time I see her in something, I'm like, she would make a really good, like, cancer victim in a movie. I don't know why. Every time I watch her, I'm like, you should be playing somebody who's going through cancer treatment right now. I, it's just this weird thought that I, I just had to share it because every time, like, I see her, I'm just like... You look like you should be wearing like a wig or just I yeah. She's like rail she thin, so I yeah. ca- I kind of get that, but uh, it's, it's like a, there, there's a f- that shade. part of her physicality just seems like she should be playing someone who's like really sick and dying. <laughs> I just want every role from now on for her to just be always breastfeeding. Every yeah, single time. we need someone breastfeeding. Someone better call Kate Dickey and uh, get her in here. Yeah, but crows. yeah, Ralph or I- Ralph or So other than Game of Thrones, he was also in Peaky Blinders. Uh, I'm not. I haven't watch Peaky Blinders that my brother is a huge Peaky Blinders person yeah. um he's also in Ready Player One Ugh. uh he is also in the new Dark Crystals series mm-hmm. uh he was in Chernobyl by HBO uh he played like one of the Russian generals I can't yeah, remember like, his name yeah I've watched that show I I, I can't pick him out in it in my head but and yeah, what I, I recognized him from was he's a, he's in Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one. He plays the pilot for uh, Yondu's crew. Yeah, I think I can picture him in that now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the only ones, I, the only other person that has a filmography is Kate Dickey. Uh, she's in Prometheus. Underrated, Ooh, really underrated movie. Yeah, no, Same. no, I, I like Prometheus. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'm a fan of Prometheus. It's just it's been a while, so I yeah, get bigger from that. Yeah, Game of Thrones, like we said, and mm-hmm. also Peaky Blinders. All Holy three shit. of them just are everyone. in Peaky Blinders. I mean, I guess it does have that old style dialogue. I'd kind of assume. I mean, obviously not like <laughs> Middle English or no. whatever, but it no, it is like a very heightened dialogue, stylized. I would say so. I don't know, maybe they like that sort of thing. And then I was just going to say that uh, Harvey Scrimshaw, who plays Caleb, he hasn't been in anything. I mean, come on, guys, this is that big of a surprise. I, I I was sitting there, and I remember like they go to the scene where he's hunting with his father, and I, I was like, oof. That was, uh, that was pretty rough there. And this is like 10 or 15 minutes in the movie, and it was enough <laughs> that I was like, wait, is the acting in this movie bad? Like, I, I was like... Yeah. I, have I misremembered everything? Then, like, no, nah, it's just that kid. He's but. weirdly like just trying to chew up the scenery. Sometimes it's it his, doesn't his make only, sense. Yeah, his only good moment is when he's kind of like uh, dying, like where he's like, yeah. I don't know, like sexually in love with Jesus. That moment, uh, like, it's very much that, like, very sexually charged, like, religious moment. Oh yeah, uh, that like I was like okay, religious ecstasy. <laughs> Yeah, I, I believe that moment. I feel like it's also very hard, like, because a lot of his scenes are with, like, Ralph Ineson, mm-hmm. and man, like, like to me, I thought he steals the show, like, over Anna Taylor-Joy, Anya Taylor-Joy. Okay, I, I can't go that far. First is Anya Taylor-Joy, 
Then it's uh, Charlie the Goat who plays Black Phillip. Mm-hmm. Come on. Well, you got we to give some love for love Charlie the Goat. Now, oh, yes. And yeah, then I Ralph Innocent. <laughs> I was going to say that I didn't finish my list because oh, I sorry, always sorry. save the best for last. And that <laughs> oh, is okay. Spoiling Charlie it. the Goat from Northern Ontario. Because oh, they man. shot this in Northern Ontario. Great. Shout out to Black Phillip. And Daniel Malik is who plays the voice and Black Phillip in the human yeah, like persona the, at the yeah, end. Yeah, the Satan. <laughs> Basically, that walks around on your Taylor Joy, like, right at the end, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I did read a really funny thing. I don't know if you guys ever saw any of the interviews about Black Phillip. Yeah, they did not. Uh, Robert and Ralph were not fans of him no i i think like ralph actually got hospitalized or something at one point because of (laughs) black (laughs) philip like ramming him or something i don't know like uh basically uh robert eggers he said like all of the animals were so easy to work with he was like i love the hair the hair just stayed in place it didn't move (laughs) like the crow is a one take or that raven whatever it is one take but it's just like black philip was like actually like hellish to work with like actually possessed like they couldn't get him to stay still or anything there's supposed to be like three different goats playing black philip or something and wound up being one uh (laughs) Like, this sounds like it was terrible. It, it, to me, it made Black Phillip even more cool. Oh, yeah, for sure. Shout Just... out to Charlie. I also thought it was really funny because I read, like, they interviewed the the keeper of him. And the keeper was like, he did really amazing. And, like, <laughs> and it was like, he did as much as he could. But you got to remember, it's a goat. He I was going to really say, care see, that you're making he, a movie. He has, he's putting it in a context of how a goat behaves everybody else is just like <laughs> fuck this fucking goat and he's like man he's actually yeah. good for a goat like well give him well some it's funny here. because I, I was looking at the end of the screenplay and originally how they had it written there was that anya taylor joy was supposed to ride black philip into the forest at the end and like black philip was supposed to get levitated <laughs> too and i was just like holy shit could you imagine her trying to ride that fucking rampaging goat <laughs> like it oh probably man what a different ending <laughs> Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like. And, and of course, now I, I regret not writing it down, but I read last night, and I can't think of why, but he is in something else as oh well. Oh, my Charlie. God. He has a recurring role? Oh, Jeez. man. He he plays, a, like, he plays a goat in something else. It's like another horror movie Damn or something. It. No, I didn't see that either, so I can't pull it up. Yeah, no, it's all right. It's just a fact that people that listen will have to find out themselves. You Google it for yourselves, guys. Um, But you brought up the awful acting of the kid that played Caleb. Yeah. And then you put it in the context of, well, he was, you know, acting opposite Ralph for a lot of the movie, so obviously he's going to look like garbage. But can we just mention Mm. that those other two kids were fucking phenomenal? Like, I thought they were excellent. Like, they were annoying as fuck, but, like... Oh, man. You know? (laughs) Just skipping around the little jingles, like the moment where, you know, the Witch of the Wood moment next to, like, the river. I was like, man, this girl is, you know, it's good stuff. It um, is, and like the the they spit out the dialogue in that dialect like mm-hmm. perfectly. I mean, to my ears, I don't. It could have been like a mangling, but like yeah, it sounded yeah. amazing to me. You know, it was just like, wow, these kids are like way better than they should be. <laughs> yeah, I'm no expert yeah. on Middle English, but man, like these kids were like killing it. You know, I I mean, it, it was great. I mean, other than that one kid, he was a little bit rough. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> That, that leads to one of the Q&A questions, I remember. They asked about the two young children. They were like, are these two children traumatized? Why were you filming such horrific things in front of them? And I was just like, this lady doesn't know how filmmaking how movies work. Like, yeah, how it works. Like, they weren't standing there actually when, like, this naked old hag is, like, you know, sucking on the teat of a goat. Like, they, they weren't actually there. And, like, Robert Eggers had to basically, basically explain to her, like, oh, no, we would just say to them, like, look surprised and they would look surprised they had actually weren't looking at something horrific but like the woman would have what like her mind was blown i was like no, there's they, didn't they actually edit films didn't, you know, <laughs> what yeah like yeah oh man it was hilarious i saw like on the blu-ray there they had the salem question and answers and oh, i saw yeah, yeah, yeah. that he had answered a similar one where he said they kind of Disneyfied the story for the kids mm-hmm. so the kids didn't actually know like what the movie fully was yes yeah. They got, like, this Disney kids version of it. Because mm-hmm. he, he did this great thing in the Salem question and answer where he uh, he was talking about uh, 
like getting them to breathe. So he'd be like, you know, we'd say, okay, breathe. Now breathe faster. Now open your mouth. Now breathe faster. Oh, coaching them through it every step of the way. And, and then he was like, they don't know why I'm getting them to do it, but he's like, boom, I just made the Mac scared. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, then I can videotape it, but they don't know that they're actually pretending to be scared of something. Mm-hmm. No, that's genius. And that's like, you know, it comes down to his direction, right? Like working with the kids, you know? Yeah. I will say the little boy, though, man, I was like, man, your teeth are big, man. Those, <laughs> he's got some big teeth. Some chompers on him. He got some chompers on him. <laughs> <laughs> so I figure let's talk about, we always kind of do some sort of order. Uh, favorite scene in the movie. I mean, I'll let one of you guys go first for this one. I feel like I've been answering first for everything. So throw out one but of your favorite no, scenes. No, you're first. the guest. You go first. No, I'll, he's thinking like you are. He's uh, trying to f- figure it out. Here, I'll go first. Okay. Uh, Cause I have like the uh, basic bitch answer. I mean, who doesn't love the live deliciously part? Oh my like, god! Yes. yes, Black Phillip. I, I listen. I'm so basic that when I first saw the movie, when I I finished watching, I told Exilia, I say like, I know Black Phillip's gonna be my next tattoo. Like that's <laughs> gonna be the next tattoo I get. So when this quarantine's over, it's going down, man. But that yeah, voice. I, like that comes out of the dark and there's such a long pause on like Anya Taylor's uh, Joy's face where she's like basically conjures him to speak to her. And it's just this yeah. long pause where you're almost like, fuck, does he even talk in this movie? I couldn't, I couldn't remember. I, I know. Like, I know. Like, I'm I pretty was like, sure he does. I can remember dialogue, but I couldn't actually, yeah. but I was like, is that something that is residing inside my skull? <laughs> like, have I distorted yeah, just... my memories of this so much? Well, and I'll tell you what was interesting about this viewing. And I'm not sure why, I don't know lighting or what it was, but when I first saw, actually, this was the only time I've seen this that I actually saw like Black Phillip yeah, as yeah, a yeah. human. Mm-hmm. I never noticed that in any of the other viewings. The other times I watched it, I don't remember seeing like his face or like his eyes yeah. or anything like that. I remember seeing like his black glove and maybe the like hand, some bits yeah. of gold. Yeah, like maybe yeah. like in his hair or on his like uh, his coat, but. Yeah, no, man, in this Blu-ray, like, when I was watching it, you could see, like, his, basically his full face. Like, no, it's not, like, this great quality or anything, but you can see, like, he has, like, basically porcelain skin, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, very, like, I don't know, it is, like, an ageless look to him. And like I said, that's basically my basic bitch answer. <laughs> I I love, I like, I love that part. Obviously, as I said before, like, Black Phillip was the highlight oh, yeah. for me. Yeah. I, I just think it was great, too, because it's such a, the movie did such a good job of, like, to me, that that scene where he's talking, like it's it, the horror is so effective in it. When like really, when you break it down, it shouldn't. It's like just a voice, and you're like, it's this goat. Like I don't really care. No, it it's like when I'm out. watching, you know, when I'm watching Sabrina, I don't care about the bass, Baphomet goat and uh, Satan. Like I don't really care. But it's they he does this great job of just creating that terror, mm-hmm. that seduction mixed with the terror. Because I'm like, yeah, I. would go with them <laughs> yeah I'm, tr- I'm trying to think because obviously that's probably like my favorite scene as well but the scene that i do remember it it's kind of like you know i shot a short film that probably won't see the light of day <laughs> but there's a scene in it that when i was watching it back i was like oh man i was kind of ripping off the witch there and it's a scene <laughs> it's a scene early in the movie and i think it might be like when it's transitioning from night to day i think they may all be standing in the field or something like that and praying or something because they just found where they're gonna put their farmland and the camera just like pans up over top of them and the music cuts in and it's like these yeah. this wailing and it's like this choral like chorus of like just pained moans and stuff and it gets keeps getting louder and louder as it pushes in towards the trees and they're all like kind of cracking and whatnot um it's a very quick moment but i remember when that happened i was like all right now i'm on edge like in this movie like all right this shit can be terrifying you know yeah that's a great scene yeah so it's very quick but like i love that moment it's very effective well, what I about feel you like Mike? i had a moment too it wasn't like <laughs> i mean you know part of me wants to just go with that last whole last act because it was so yeah. fucking terrifying and you know it breaks off from that like smoldering quality of the rest of the movie um mm-hmm. but honestly to me like the one thing i always remember other than anything involving the rabbit and like philip because i just the close-ups <laughs> of them even when they're not doing anything is just like yeah it just it fucking terrifies me in my core but it's just the part when she's playing peekaboo with the baby and it disappears 
Like oh, I just so good. I think it's such a subtle and very very startling moment, right? Like, and it kind of yeah. That's sort of like the recipe for the rest of the film. I find like it's it's not this over the top. Like it doesn't you know the witch doesn't come and like you know it's just it's <laughs> nothing visceral. It's just this like literally blink and he's gone there's no explanation like and it's it's so startling and out of nowhere and i just think that that is where the power of this movie lies and i just love it and of it's... course i mean it leads to that scene with uh the old like granny ass and she's making that like oh yeah the... that baby butter like baby the... oh my god <laughs> oh my god like it's a pretty disturbing scene like, but and, and, that, and that, that is and it's a weird like yeah. you, you almost forget about it when it falls back into that lull, like you were talking about earlier, the kind of like rhythm mm-hmm. where something kind of like startling or scary happens. And then it just sort of like everything goes back to almost like normal in a way. But like, yeah, that and it does. It, it transitions into that like absolutely like shocking, disturbing moment and then drops off again. But like, you know, it sets up the rest of the movie. And I just I think it's such a, a brilliant early moment. And yeah, I love it. Yeah. And it's I believe like that was in the trailer. The- maybe and yeah, i think probably. that's um, the, the peekaboo was yeah. yeah yeah and that that really like um i don't know that was one of the moments in the trailer that really struck me and i was like oh this is gonna be like a really cool movie you know i can't wait it's yeah yeah it's like 20 minutes into this movie you have like a witch ru- rubbing like strawberry jam on her broomstick and flying into the sky like right. within like 20 minutes and then it's like all right 40 minutes and we're talking about who stole the silver cup yeah. but <laughs> you know it, it is a very shocking moment for sure well and i was gonna say too uh like another thing i noticed with this viewing and i i feel like it's every time i view this i'm like i never remember the witch being in it as much as she actually oh, yeah. is yeah because i was watching it and i'm i'm like was she in it this much when like last time i saw it yeah. and i mean obviously yeah but i it just does this great thing where i think like you said like you you get those jolts and then it, it lulls so mm-hmm. long and i think it helps with when you're viewing it again because you think about like i know when i watch it the kind of pacing i'm gonna get so I never expect the stuff when it comes. Yeah, it, and it deals with so many like harsh cuts, like the the wood chopping scenes where it just like I don't know, they just smash cut the weird things every now and then. Like doing stuff like that is like even if it's kind of like the imagery itself isn't scary. Like I said, it just kind of puts you on edge, and you're like, all right, why are we snapping to an extreme close up of Ralph Innocent chopping wood? But it's like, <laughs> all right, it kind of works. There's something like very serious about this right now. Yeah, so. the form is very like jarring in itself it's very yeah. interesting yeah and i was gonna say too uh because you mentioned it briefly there colton that i was gonna say to me more scary than the witch and more scary than black philip is like the soundtrack oh, and yeah. just the sound in general like he he uses it so well in this to build that atmosphere mm-hmm. that's always like when i first saw it every time i watch this it's the first thing i notice like you know you're getting into some shit with the soundtrack and just the sounds you're you're there you're you feel like you're there yeah like the composer like uh mark corvin like he did an amazing job and he built like a very specific instrument like for this movie he, he calls it like the apprehension engine or something oh like gosh. that it's fr- it's friggin' weird but if you look at it it's like i don't know if you guys like as kids would put like your ruler on the edge of your desk and kind of like pluck it oh and make yeah this sound yeah, and no. move the ruler up and down <laughs> it's like he has four Four or five rulers strung next to each other, like a guitar string, like this weird wheel. And he's just like mixing it all together. And it makes like the creepiest sounds ever. Like, I don't even know how the hell the dude came up with it. But like, yeah, the soundtrack on this is like, (laughs) it it might be like one of the best parts. Like, I do really like the cinematography and Anya Taylor-Joy's, you know, acting. But man, that soundtrack is like scary, like very unnerving. And like weirdly subtle. (laughs) You know, like, yeah, like I, I when I think back on it, I was like, I thought the soundtrack was like all the time. Yeah, <laughs> there's lots of moments where it's just like, you know, them sitting in a house praying or eating food or whatever. Yeah. It's not there, you know, but yeah, I know when it comes up, it's incredibly effective. The other thing I wanted to bring up, too, is like I really I enjoy that other than the witch and other than the soundtrack and all that stuff that I think they do a real good job in kind of bringing terror grounding the terror within the family of Mm -hmm. like this family breaking apart and like every time i watch it i'm like so invested in it that you're just like 
watching this family deteriorate and like you know uh, the mother withdrawing rightfully so you know dealing with the depression hitting after the loss of a child and then another loss of a child but then everything like Anya Taylor Joy is dealing with with her parents and becoming a woman Mm -hmm. and and just dealing with all that like they did a really good job of kind of creating that family terror in it yeah the 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 area of that that I didn't remember was I didn't remember that like sexual repression or like right on the edge of uh, adolescence with the Caleb, like the young actor. Like, yes, I, yeah. I didn't remember I saw him. him looking at those. Tits. Yeah, I know. I was like, I was like, man, I do not remember this. And he's just there leering at his sister like on two or three occasions. And then like the payoff of him being like lured into the witch's hovel by like the you know this you know somewhat attractive lady who when she smiles she kind of has messed up teeth but and dirty feet. But you know it, it's like. Oh, I get it now. Like I understand. Like you know, it's this lust. It was that's the rack. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was the rack. A hundred percent. Yeah. She, and she it's so funny because, in a way, it's like it, it kind of flouts a lot of like horror tropes. But I was when I was watching it in prep for this, mm-hmm. I was like, man, I didn't realize that they sort of kept a lot of them in and like. Like here's this like horny teen boy who <laughs> is like his his fucking hormones are his undoing. Like shocker. yeah, it's like I could either look at my mom or my sister. I think he chooses his sister because he's in the middle of nowhere. But I was like, man, I do not remember this. Like yeah, oh uh, but, my god, so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I was gonna say is like I I do find it's weird with a lot of horror movies though. The directors they go on to kind of say like. I don't know, you listen to Robert Eggers talk about this movie. He will say it's a horror movie, but he'll be like, it's a family drama first and foremost. Or you listen to like Ari Aster talk about Hereditary. It's like, oh, well, it's a family drama and an exploration of grief. Or like Midsummer, it's a breakup movie. You know, it's like, it's weird. Like they don't want to label it as like a horror straight up. But then like the marketing around this movie was like, no, this is a horror movie. This it's is the scariest yeah. thing ever. Yeah. And I always wonder with that, I'm like, is that uh, is that an accurate thing? They'd be like, no, no, it's about the family breakup. Or I'm like, is that just the pretension coming out mm-hmm. and they want to be like, oh, well. They want to be taken serious. A more exactly. complex than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I feel like it's probably a bit of both there for sure. Yeah, there's definitely a bit of a gambit in terms of like, I am going to kind of play it so that if it doesn't get taken seriously as a horror film, I can just say it wasn't a horror film. (laughs) And if it does, I mean, you know. There's definitely a reason why all those like prestigious horror movies, like they just kind of downplay them and be like, oh, it's a thriller. (laughs) You know, it's like Silence of the Lambs, you know, one best picture. It's a thriller or (laughs) or, you know, like Get Out when it was doing really well. Like people didn't want to classify it as a a horror as a thriller. You know, it's I I, I like it when the directors own it and be like, no, this is a horror movie. It's also a family drama, but it's still a horror. movie. Yes, it's (laughs) you're not going to file it like if it was the 90s in Blockbuster under drama. (laughs) Yeah, no. I'm sorry. That's that's what I think of. I'm like, where 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 would you have put that in a video store? <laughs> like, it's lots not... of unhappy families there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's like the witch, and then you know, like Ingmar Bergman. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't believe we've got this far into uh, this podcast without Mike talking about uh, crows eating your nipples. I, I already sure. brought it up. I said, bring in the crows. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't harp on it. I mean, what do you want me to say? <laughs> He's a huge fan. I I love those cuts from you know like when I was rewatching it. I was like, "There's no way this isn't one of Mike's favorite scenes." I, <laughs> okay, I don't know why I thought not, of you. I'm but... not gonna lie. I was gonna say that was my favorite scene in the movie, <laughs> but then I sort of backpedaled and was like, "I don't want to sound like I'm fucking demented," but I just thought it was very effective as a horror device. And again, mm-hmm. the like cut between you know what was happening outside from and we you know obviously that either it's hysteria or you know a spell or something but when it smash cuts back and you know crow or uh, raven Raven, or whatever 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 it is yeah (laughs) chewing on her nap like it's a fucking pacifier i was gonna say too like i also love the way he uses those horror devices but like we get that scene the crows and then you know, William wakes up. We do see the blood on her shirt, but like that's never dealt with. No. Like you just like it's there. You saw it. It's that secret between you and Catherine, mm-hmm. and like that's it. You, there's no. 
I love movies when they don't explain everything to us like we're idiots. Oh yeah, he definitely doesn't spoon feed the audience, that's for sure. And that's why I that's why I think like with modern horror audiences like that are used to seeing like, I don't know, Blumhouse's Truth or Dare or walking into like every conjuring movie, even the sequels, thinking it's like the scariest thing ever or whatever. It's yeah. like it it's not that type of movie at all, right? Like it's much yeah. more in line with like, I don't know, the the Babadook or I don't know. Wait, Fantasy Island. Yeah. No. <laughs> Fantasy Island. Oh, man, that's trash. <laughs> Shouldn't even mention that in this podcast review. <laughs> that was going to be the uh, first exclusive Patreon content. Was it? I had to rethink that one. Yeah, no, that's well, Yeah, because I went and saw it on, like, the last day the theater was open. Okay. Yeah, yeah. don't do it. No, no, no. It, it was, <laughs> it, it was so that. bad. Yeah. I watched, I think, that and Sonic in the same day, and I was like, Sonic's a masterpiece. Sonic is a masterpiece, yeah. Yeah. So- Sonic probably looks like it was made by like kubrick in comparison (laughs) i was gonna say do we want to talk about uh you know our next question of is it actually scary is the film scary i think that's a good question and i think colton should be the one to answer it (laughs) of course um is it scary i mean as someone who writes horror i don't know if i really find many movies scary anymore i'm always like looking at like all right here's the beat like all right you know she opens up the cabinet, nothing's there. She closes it in the mirror, nothing's there, you know. She pulls open the curtain, nothing's there. And it's like, all right, the camera's gonna pan around her and there it is, you know, I'm always waiting for like the beats of a scene. Uh, I do think he breaks away from that a little bit with like the harsh cutting and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But like I said, it, it's it's pretty uh, surprising now when I get like spooked out or, you know, a jump scare hits me. Um, but I would definitely say the moving's unnerving. And as someone, like I mentioned, I think earlier in the podcast, who grew up in a Christian household, there's something that's kind of like taboo while watching it. And I think there's like this yeah. actual feeling of like, you know, no, you know, no one was possessed in the movie. And I know it's, you know, all that stuff. But it feels like I find this movie feels like unlike some other movies, it feels like there is this evil <laughs> in there somewhere, even if it's just the goat running around. <laughs> like, like I don't know. I, I find there is something foreboding and evil about it. But like I said, like I, I kind of look past that and just admire the filmmaking more than, you know, being scared of it. Yeah, I, I feel that's what ends up happening when you just look at movies so closely. Yeah, when you're like analyzing and dissecting things, it does take a little bit out of like the fun of just like, oh my God, they were hiding in the closet with a knife you know it's like all right you know but i mean you can still kind of like objectively step back and go like this is still creepy right like it's even though you've picked it apart in your head and kind of um yeah i I would definitely say there it definitely has its creepy moments it's just i don't know if the people that would be like truly horrified by some of them would make it to that point in the movie you know it's fair enough fair i mean enough. Other, yeah. other than the first which is hovel stuff i mean you know seeing that naked old woman on the floor and stuff is pretty freaky you know? smearing herself with anyway <laughs> baby baby butter <laughs> baby I think butter, we need. yeah that was we'll, we'll maybe Sounds rethink like weird... we'll rethink that phrase because um i think <laughs> yeah, baby maybe. butter can be widely interpreted as another it's substance so <laughs> yeah. yeah no not that substance i'm talking about the baby ground up <laughs> yes but butter made from <laughs> actual baby <laughs> even better when and like uh black philip later in the movie says like doth thou like the taste of butter <laughs> or something like that you know? <laughs> oh god oh god oh oh my maybe there is some real sexual innuendos in here that oh, we are just missing <laughs> there is in the movie for sure I, uh, absolutely yeah. <laughs> Um, all that Mike, repression you? all that repression bubbles out somewhere let me tell you i i liked um not sort of looking at it like a lot of times when i go see a movie especially when I am watching it and I feel like I'm appreciating the filmmake, the filmmaking. I tend to kind of like force myself to just ride with it. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. to not, cause I'm not like a filmmaker um, or a screenwriter like Colton, um, you know, although I have studied film and I do like, I've written, you know, pieces of film criticism and stuff and Mm -hmm. um, took like film studies in school and things like that. But I, I still try to, especially my first viewing of something, just like kind of divorce myself and just ride it. And I'm actually very good at doing that, which is maybe like a mental defect. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> um, I kind of agreed with a lot of what Colton said. Um, I don't find it to be like, I think the kind of like them touting this scariness of it is more of a marketing ploy than anything. But I did find that, again, as you mentioned earlier, that 
it's kind of Shakespearean in a way. And there's this like rot, like mm-hmm. you said, it's like unease the whole time, but there's this sense of rot, whether it be a rotten witch out in the woods or they're like family rotting from the inside. The land you itself know. being rotten, like the exactly. corn won't spread. Yeah. Yes. Right. And it's, mm-hmm. it's yeah. to me, that's, it's got this, like, it's like the, the land is kind of like, um, mirroring what's happening like with their family and then with the witches and to me that kind of visual and rhetorical device is actually really creepy <laughs> like I like that it's not like the events themselves are when the, the scary moments happen they are very jarring and you know somewhat shocking especially to people who aren't used to this type of horror movie and are just going for like the more vanilla stuff but i just i love i find that like that if you pay attention to that kind of like um like the doublings and that like kind of shakespearean element to it that it is very uh, the rot to me is creepy i guess is what i'm trying to say <laughs> that that element but it is but it's very like macbeth you know what i mean yeah, yeah, and yeah. um like with the witches and um just everything that's going on and I find that to be very, very creepy because it's not traditionally creepy, mm-hmm. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's it's not, I'm not, I wasn't scared by it. I do. And I will say, though, I do also find um, animals that are like stand-ins for Satan to be very creepy. So yeah. I do. I love like the Black Phillip. I love the rabbit um, mm-hmm. that did make my skin crawl, but it was more of a like appreciation of it. Um, yeah the his use scariest, of like imagery and yeah i was just gonna say yeah the scariest moment for sure is rowan's favorite scene like where black philip like changes shape and his voice and all that and creeps around her like that is like that is a good horror scene for sure it is like, it's a very yeah. good horror scene yeah it's it's yeah. got good horror scenes i just don't find it to be overall like overly scary but i don't mm-hmm. know it's it it's got like i said that unease and yeah when you finish watching it you don't quite feel right which i think is something that a horror movie should do to you i guess is my point <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I I agree. And I was going to say, I think Colton really hit it the nail on the head with unnerving. To me, when I watch it, like, it, it's not a jump scare movie. It's not Rowan watching Sinister for the first time mm-hmm, yeah. and, and terrible jump scares just being like, yeah, yeah, okay, you got me. Uh, but it's unnerving, which to me, it, as an avid horror watcher, I feel like that's kind of what we end up appreciating more just because it's not so gimmicky. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about movies like this. that have that like slow build is that we're just that unnerving feeling that is created from the beginning through that hour and a half runtime. So I can just be uncomfortable and not, I don't necessarily have to be so scared. And like we keep saying, like many of the things, right? Uncomfortable at like the family situations or, you know, the way Caleb's looking at those boobs. (laughs) Like, yeah, there's just unsettling. Everything is unsettling about it. And I really think that's the best word to describe it. But I think you need to be, and I think you kind of touched on this earlier. Uh, Colton was that I don't think that if you're not a, I don't think you would get it if you're not a horror guy yeah. or gal I, I think it's actually harder to create that like sense of dread for like how long is this movie like what an hour and a half like yes yeah. yeah I don't know I think it's harder to create that sense of tension and dread for that amount of time than it is to put in I don't know a violin squeal like you know, when a cat walks across the hallway or like a ball hits the window or something like that, you know, I think it's harder to create like such an atmosphere and tone and sustain it for that long. Yeah. Well, because it's not cheap, right? No, it's, it's not. Like, it, and when you get those moments where it boils over, mm-hmm. it's earned, right? Yeah, it's That's that much kind of the way I look at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and I figure this part, I want to kind of have an open floor if there's any anything else we want to talk about with the film oh. of course i'll ask you guys would it have been more scary if the movie ended like the way robert egger said he did consider doing so at the q a i was at he said in his research um he found out that apparently like something that uh, like these witches or satanic cults or whatever would do is they would pass the goat around and kiss its anus 
And uh, apparently, originally, he was going to end the movie with the witches going ass the mouth on Black Phillips. So oh would, would that God. have made the movie better or worse, guys? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, and now I'm having a field day in my head of trying to picture that. Oh. Yeah, and I was just like, no, nah, you probably made the right choice cutting that out, but like, no, nah, I'm not in there. I mean, I get that, like... He's he's obviously very meticulous and rigorous yeah. in his research and his execution. So yeah. I would have appreciated the rigor of his research. Yeah. Absolutely. Do I think that it should have ended like that? I would say I think I think he made the right choice too. Yeah, I, know. I, I think yeah, so. I um I'm gonna say um maybe some things are better left to the imagination. A hundred percent. That is definitely one of them. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, as, as much as, you know, uh, my my body's telling me... I should, no, I'm not going to quote R. <laughs> Kelly on that oh, one. No, oh, no. no. Yeah. Yeah, no. As much as I want to say yes, like, I, I'd probably want to see that on film, just to say I saw that on film. I, I think he... I think it ended appropriately. Yeah. I, I really... And I also really like that once we get to the witches at the ending, like, that... Black Phillip's not really like he's yet again not the center of attention. Yeah. I think that just adds the more creepy part that he's just kind of like walking around, just being a goat. Yeah, it's it's nice because you know you do see him like running into the woods after Thomas and yeah. There, but like at the end, it is more so about her and kind of becoming part of the coven and like floating up into the air and like her ecstasy of like whether or not that's you know like hey i shed all these religious values whether or not that's being like part of something bigger whether or not that's like her power like you know it's left up to interpretation of what's happening there at the end but yeah i think it's i think it's pretty strong ending there like (laughs) floating way above the trees it's pretty pretty cool yeah no i i 100 percent agree with that do we have anything else we'd like to discuss i mean i got loads to go on but i'm not sure like i'm not i'm not sure like how much like you guys really read into things or whatnot but uh, no, go ahead. No, like uh, what I really appreciated with it, like, you know, just looking into some like creepier paintings and works of art and stuff myself, you know, just for inspiration more than anything else. I really did like how he kind of referenced like Francisca Goya's, like some of his like his witches. <gasps> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like there is shit in this movie that I'm like, man, I, I swear I saw that before. Like, especially now when I was rewatching it, I had to like pull up these paintings and be like, no, he's 100% referencing that. There's like, I don't know, yeah. these old And I mean, women. like the, the lack of color and everything in it oh, too, yeah, kind yeah. of like is, is to me could be like a nod to that and that it's, you know, kind of like the Goya is very much like a stark, like kind of black and white, you know. Yeah. The, any splash of color is used to make a point, which is, I think, something that he kind of borrowed for the visual of the movie. Oh, for sure. It's like no small wonder why his next movie was just black and white. He was just like, oh, screw it. You know, <laughs> like yeah, exactly. Just go full on. Right. Like just. Yeah. But those Goya paintings, like there's one with like literally witches sitting around a black goat in the middle of them, you know, or like there's one with like uh, a bunch of women like flying in the air, like in a circle, you know, as like someone's below them kind of like wandering around blind or something, warding off spirits. You know, there's there's a, a few of those paintings where I was like, oh, he was heavily inspired by this, like for the visual aesthetic of this movie, for sure. Yeah. And they, they do, like Mike said, like he does a really great job uh, with the coloring. Cause I mean, obviously people know that, you know, I know me and Exilia and Mike, like we love that Suspiria, that Mark Renth color, like bright neon mm-hmm. colors. Yeah. 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 And it's like, if you're going to reel me in with not that, this is what I want. Like, as bleak as possible, like, just grays and browns. And And I mean, it's true to the puritanical, like, aesthetic, which is literally that they don't have an aesthetic because to have an aesthetic is like a sin <laughs> yeah it's you so... can't have decoration you can't have a church that like looks beautiful like you know this like catholic you know fucking masterpieces Basilica, yeah. it's like literally just clapboard out in the woods like <laughs> yeah. that's it yeah no paint no nothing no uh no color fabric there's no dye here it's not no yeah it's so sparse yeah, exactly. and gray that like every single time they go outside with like a lantern or something like your lights just yeah. like your eyes just drawn to it like it's it's so much stronger you know do i think maybe some things would have been nicer with a bit of color yeah sometimes but it overall Absolutely, like yeah. he's like his aesthetic like he nails what he's going for for sure you know i don't want every movie to be black and white or you know shades of gray but yeah yeah no 100 percent. i mean hit us with anything else you got to talk about cool no no I was, I was gonna ask you guys about the dialogue in particular like uh i know you guys haven't seen the lighthouse yet so um that's a little bit 
uh, off to the side. But do you did you guys have trouble like understanding the dialogue in this at all? Was it anything that was like a bit of a hurdle? Like I don't know. You said Exilia wasn't the biggest fan. Was <laughs> did she like that stuff or like <laughs> you know like? What do you guys feel about the script? I was gonna say I know uh, when we watched it, like uh, I can't say Exilia is not the biggest fan of that uh, languaging, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I I don't think she was thrilled on that stuff. Mm-hmm. And see me, like I'm I'm really big, like I love like Shakespeare stuff like that, and I I feel like the way he wrote it, I I think Mike said like very Shakespearean. Mm-hmm. Where, to me, even if you're someone that doesn't, like, you might not get, you might only get every other word they're saying, you get it. Like, Some context you, you piece uh, it together, yeah. Yeah, you understand, like, with the emotion and the inflection they're using, like, it was very poetic to me. Like, every, I think it was a great choice. And not to say that I think, you know, every period piece should should be like this. You know, I'm a big, you know, on a, a side tangent, like, I'm a big fan. Like, I love uh, the Mary Antoinette movie mm-hmm. where they just use, like, early 2000s <laughs> lingo in this. Much, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, I think you can do that, but for this, it's just, it really added, like, this gravitas to Mm -hmm. it. I mean, I didn't look into it, but I would say, like, Ralph Einstein, like, he's probably Shakespearean trained. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah, like, you could definitely tell that that they, they held some weight with it. And I thought it, yeah, I thought it worked really well. It was effective. And it brought you into that world, Mm -hmm. which I think you need to be invested in the period. Uh, I don't know. What do you think, Mike? No, absolutely. It was, um, I found, um, well, I mean, it was a bit jarring for the first few minutes because I wasn't expecting this, like, kind of early modern English. Um, I just assumed that they were going to maybe try to put on a regional accent and that was it. And the dialogue was just going to be written in kind of modern English, um, mm-hmm. like contemporary English. So that was a bit jarring at first because I was not expecting it to be as rigorously done as it obviously was. But it was so fucking immersive. Like I I found I was almost like addicted to listening to them talk. Like I said, the little kids, like the way they spat that dialect out was insane um i just i found once i got into the rhythm of it after a few minutes i was like man this is no no worse than reading fucking middle english with all its (laughs) weird you know (laughs) s's that look like f's and things like that so i was like no i can ride with this it's i just thought like i said i thought it was very immersive it really put me onto that that firm um and i just think that everybody did a really good job because everybody in this movie is fucking brilliant with um, yeah, several other than cop Caleb. Cop exceptions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about him, but uh And if you if you don't like the language, I mean the the payoff comes when with Black Phillip. Like oh. I'm like, it's a winner, it's a winner. Mm-hmm. If he had to just said something stupid at the end, like it just wouldn't have worked. <laughs> Do you want to live deliciously instead of like the you know, like it'd be like, Well, that's not quite as hard hitting, I guess, you know. It's not like ageless, you know. And yeah, yet no, somehow has turned into a meme. Oh yeah, <laughs> like that's. Yeah. I feel like that's a meme now. It's like yeah. I feel like it's on T-shirts and tote bags <laughs> for people that are you know into this sort of thing. I'll have to make sure when I get my uh, black Philip tattoo that I don't have anything about live deliciously. I'll just have like, do you like? Do you like to eat baby butter? Oh no. <laughs> yes, get the phrase get that, "baby please. butter" tattooed on your body. Just ba- baby just butter. Do it. Do oh, it. My Lord. I I need you to do this. I need to I need a follow up and like how your life is going after you you get that done. So are you guys uh, ready to go into rating yeah, this? Yeah, go for so, it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, hopefully uh, everyone that's listening has you know been following for a bit. But if you don't know, we have uh, we have rating categories. So we have nay. Okay, yay, and slay. Let's start with uh, Mike. Let's start with Mike. Oh, I'll give it a yay. Um, Kind of like Colton said, it's not like my favorite movie I've ever seen before, but it has so much going for it. Um, He's such a talented filmmaker. It does have that like creepy sense of unease that goes the whole time that like, frankly, you'd be teetering on an edge and in the hands of a lesser filmmaker, it would have failed horribly. Mm-hmm. And... Even the, like, really intense scenes were not overdone, so I just... It's not something that I can watch a lot because it's... You know, it it is a slow burn, and, uh, you know, the the dialect, while it's brilliant and well-acted and well-performed, it can just 
it can be a bit much. So it's not like, say, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, which I can watch every <laughs> week, every day for the rest of my life. I can watch it three or four times a day and never get sick of it. Um, you said Nightmare on Elm Street 3? Yes. Uh, I... Oh, I think you screwed up and you meant two. Um, that too, like but anyway. We, there? Yeah. Oh, I listen, you guys can't see it, but in my bedroom, there's a giant like print of it that's like five feet tall oh, okay, up on my wall. Okay. So <laughs> it actually hangs over my bed. So oh, all right. <laughs> creepy. And actually, I have one of number four as well, and I switch them out every couple months. Nice. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's it's a real feat of like, and, and like we were saying earlier, it is one, definitely one of the movies that ushered in that like kind of contemporary wave of like prestige horror like you were saying and like Mm -hmm. a24 have really kind of like you know that's like one of their calling cards now i find and even the aesthetic of that studio themselves was kind of on display in the movie it was kind of like a calling card so i don't know i just think it's a great movie in that regard i don't know about you guys well let's go to colton i'm very interested now yeah i know people are gonna be like why the hell did you choose this movie like because like i said it's not like a you know it's not what i'd call like a masterpiece and personally like it's just a movie like i said it's kind of for me like whenever i watch it it's just like oh my expectations were too high and i feel like every single time they're always too high so it's it's something that i think like i said i just appreciate robert eggers like uncompromising vision being like yo i'm making this feature film i'm gonna have weird old english dialogue it's gonna be you know a very slow burn it's gonna have a slightly weird aspect ratio which gets even weirder in his next film so it's something that i appreciate but uh, I don't know if I'd say, like, I truly enjoy it. And I, I'm a bit of a harsher critic anyways. You know, I'm one of those listeners where I'm like, oh, my God, they kind of slay everything. You know, I need Exilia there to kind of take things down a notch. Um, we, we admit that, too. Yeah. We admit so, uh, yeah, it, for me, it's a, it's a yay. It's a movie like, you know, if I was rating it on Letterboxd, I'd be like, yeah, it's a great movie. You know, it's but I, you know, it's a couple steps away from like masterpiece territory for me. And I think his. Uh, sophomore film the lighthouse to me is a stronger film but it's also less of a horror film so you know there's a bit of a trade-off there well i mean i don't want to disappoint so (laughs) i i i have it down as a slay oh my god Uh, this is a movie a groundbreaking development by the way (laughs) i'm shocked (laughs) i know i know this is a movie that ever since i saw it i it's always included in like lists i make if i'm talking to someone of like horror movies that i love Mm -hmm. i mean i definitely think it's kind of a modern i think it will be considered a modern masterpiece if it isn't already i think it has the potential to be a masterpiece in general and i mean maybe like i said to me maybe just the joy and connection I have to old Charlie. Uh, <laughs> to me, like, I, I, like, Black Phillip is immediately was put in my pantheon of, like, great horror figures that I, I just love. Like, I consider him in my top phase. I probably put him over Jason or Freddy. Like, I, I just really liked him. Yeah, I, I, it's just a feeling. I feel like it's a feeling. <laughs> and I know that's not a good reason because, me and Mike give Slay to things that should make us feel terrible. This is um, true. This is true. Yeah. And I know the backlash, like Mandy got me and I said Mandy wasn't good. And Oh, dude, I I, I'm, I'm with you on that one, actually. But I mean, that might I, be I a hot back. take. That I, might be a hot take. I like now that I've gone back, I've said I do really like Mandy. I was just trying to cause havoc. Listen, but... listen if I was on here, I'm sorry. Like Midsummer, I would give that a nay. I'd give Mandy a nay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, people would hate me, I guess. So uh, No, I understand that, though. Yeah. I totally get it. I yeah. just, but again, and it's like, it's, it's all subjective anyway. Oh, a hundred percent, man. Yeah. I don't get, I'm not one of those people that get mad at people. It's more so just fun no. listening, right? I prefer the conversation <laughs> than the ratings, right? Exactly. Like, a dialogue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and we, we always say that's the thing about it, right? Is like, to me, when I think of the witch, I think of a sleigh, but I'm sure there's going to be times I watch it when it's not a sleigh for me. Yeah. And I'm just like, uh, but Yeah, I just, I always, it's a movie I always enjoy watching, but I will kind of in an asterisk put, I don't think it would ever be anyone's slay if they watch it more than once a year. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I I definitely don't think it's a movie you can watch all the time and you're like, I enjoy this. Yeah. You got to be willing to go through it. Yeah, it was definitely something this time, like taking some notes with it, having a bit of fun with the notes and kind of preparing for it. I definitely did enjoy it and appreciate it. 
more than before. I mean, it, I still came out in the end with like the same rating that I gave it, but I still, you know, it was like, I enjoyed the ride for sure. And, you know, I could appreciate yeah. it yeah. a lot more than like the first time I saw it, whatever it was four or five years ago. God, that was five years ago. Oof. Yeah, I know. Man. Oof, yeah. <laughs> 2015. Yeah. So now we, uh, are, I don't know how fair it's going to be because I don't know what uh, Colton's knowledge is of the budget. Uh, I, 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 I Listen, I didn't search it up for this, but I have a feeling it was like $3 million. So if I'm right, I don't know, then I guess just we'll, say, we'll have to yeah, see. Yeah, go ahead. Guess, Mike, I guess. I'm not sure. Mike, the budget game, it's time. I would have said. So how much did it cost? Like $5 million. I was thinking five or roundabout, give or take okay. one or two million. This is, I think this is the first uh, It Slays. So the first time Colton's on and the first It Slays that we have a tie. Oh, what? Because it's four million. <gasps> oh, shit. Wow. Right. wow. I, yeah. I don't know, man. There was like, I didn't, like I said, I didn't Google it, but there was like a feeling within me that I was like, I pre- thought it was three million, but wow. All right. Yeah. But you, actually, if we're, and like if we're playing by game. Price is Right rules, it's whoever gets closest without going over. So really, <laughs> I went massively over. So. <laughs> I mean, a million dollars is not a lot, obviously, but it yeah. is a lot. <laughs> and I have no clue what it made at the box office either, but... Okay, yeah. so we'll, this will be a little more interesting. So what do you think it made, Mike? I don't know, like 12 or 13 million? I, That's very fair. I think I'm going to go with uh, the number 23. I'll go 23 million. I don't know. Oh, I'm not go. sure. <laughs> Was that an ode to the uh, amazing Jim Carrey? Oh, Carey of course. Film yeah, I found that movie pretty <laughs> unnerving at the time too. <laughs> uh, so Colton definitely will take it. Uh, it made forty point oh, four wow. million oh, wow. dollars worldwide. That's a big A twenty four hit. Yeah the the U S numbers were twenty five million, okay. but globally it made forty point four. Wow. Uh, so definitely, uh, I'd say they made a little bit of money back. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I I was really trying to think that I think it's worth mentioning because I didn't mention earlier that I think this was kind of the first A24 film that I kind of recognized it was A24 where I'm like, all right, like I have to watch these guys now. Dude, I'm such a big fan of A24. Like if I wasn't in my sweater here, I literally have an A24 T-shirt on. Like I like I love nice. that love that production and distribution company. Like yeah, they have just a a style to every movie and I'm not saying every movie's good. I mean, they've put out some stinkers as well, but usually with the horror stuff, I find like there's at least a quality and polish there. Like I said, the prestige horror, you know. They put exactly, out a lot of those, yeah. right? They they yeah, they are exactly. they became very influential like very quick i think yeah. like they like you said there's there's like a signature style to it and i really appreciate that again even if i don't like all the movies necessarily mm-hmm. um there's there's an aesthetic and they stick to it and i i really respect that <laughs> yeah yeah so i briefly just want to do some promotional plugs uh just make sure to follow us all on our social media so uh it slays podcast at everything uh twitter facebook instagram uh i did want to give you a chance colton to drop any uh (laughs) social or anything yeah i mean i don't have anything like readily to point to but i mean uh if you want to see what i'm posting on twitter you know hot takes about i don't know tiger king or something you can follow me at (laughs) at cje simpson and i'm the same on instagram but i'm not gonna lie i'm pretty inactive i mean i wanted to use that as like a more of a professional platform and i mean i guess i don't have too much to share right now um other than that like what i post on and love uh, is letterboxd i don't know if either of you guys have that but uh I do. I haven't used it in forever. Okay. I I gave I, I gave a, a high rating review on uh, the first Friday movie. Okay. And then I got I got attacked because apparently Friday got canceled or something, oh, and it, it was a bad scene. Yeah. I, I I used to post quite a few reviews on there, but I kind of use it now as like a, just as a nerd to log everything I watch when I watch it. Exclusive uh, yeah. tags. I was gonna say statistics. it's kind of like some people with with Goodreads, right? It's, yeah. It's, it's 100%. Of like a hundred percent library. Yeah, but if people want to follow me on that, I'm at X. C J E S because you know I still have that emo <laughs> X in the beginning of, of course, the username on there. But uh yeah, no, I mean I uh, hopefully at some point I'll have something for you guys to promote or point towards. But yeah, right now, just that's about it. Um your Twitter is amazing, so everyone should follow, obviously. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> follow it now. <laughs> uh the only other thing I wanted to plug was uh two things. One was uh our Spotify playlist. Uh Exilia has a task because I gave her some new stuff to add to it. 
Uh, but the It Slays horrific uh, playlist, and it's just movies we watch, review, some that we haven't reviewed yet. We try to add, whether it's soundtrack stuff or actual, like, thematic music, just anything to kind of get you in that horror mood, because that's what you want to hear when you first wake up in the morning <laughs> is... The psycho score. Is, uh, <laughs> it is the music from The Witch, just like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grunt. That like wailing Scream. sound, screaming, is <laughs> reverberating like through your house oh, yeah, while man. you, That's you know, make toast. Yeah. <laughs> And the only other thing I wanted to mention uh, was the Patreon. So uh, it slays podcasts on Patreon, uh, and there's different tiers there. Colton is a Patreon member, uh, and he picked this. That was one of the tiers. You got to pick a movie, uh, and we are very glad. Uh, our boy Ash picked uh, Evil Dead early nice. on when we started, uh, and Cecily picked Most Likely to Die, which I know we don't regret <laughs> watching. That was not 80 minutes of my life that I could ever get back on. <laughs> <laughs> In sarcasm. But yeah, uh you know, definitely go take a look and uh, you don't need to do it now. We know the quarantine's hard. Money's hard. We're we're not that desperate. You know, we don't really make anything from it. It pays for us to have our hosting and uh, check it out. Uh, and yeah, just keep commenting, listening, review us on iTunes, give us a rating, anything to uh, just show that you like what you hear. And I think that's everything. I'm hoping we will definitely get Colton back ASAP. I would uh, absolutely just, love that. Oh, I'd love to come back this whenever you guys fun. want. Yeah, that's, you know, it'd be great. Yeah, and uh, we got to get him and Exilia together. So <laughs> Yes, I, 100%. Uh, Exilia yeah. has a fair fight against us. I, I, like I said, I was a little bit let down that she wasn't here just because I wanted to see her kind of like yeah. rip this movie apart or, you know, be a little bit more harsh on it, but. Oh well, next time I guess. Yeah, no, it's a, but it's a good excuse to to have a have a sequel now. Yes, for it's, sure. Yes. yes, and once again, you know, thank you guys for having me. You know, this was this was great. I've been itching to get back on the mic for like eight or nine months now, so very therapeutic. Um, well, there you go. Thank you so much for for supporting us and for coming on and your thoughtful um, commentary and dialogue. Like this has been a real treat tonight oh. i gotta say it's yeah it's it's been amazing and I, like i said I, I i can see us inviting you back for many and many more Perfect. this was a yeah, good time yeah we're, we're putting it on the record right now it's gonna happen <laughs> all right and it won't take us a yeah year whatever it was days. eight or yeah. nine months yeah come on once a year the annual colton episode <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean you know it could be worse than that but oh 100 percent. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's everything. Uh, as always, I am Rowan. And this is mine. And I guess it's COVID Colton for now. <laughs> See you later.